Hey guys, Dr. Gooden back with a foot and ankle. In this video, we'll talk about the joint movements. Let's learn about our bodies. So the first joint to talk about is the tibiofibular joint. This is the joining of the fibula with the tibia at the proximal and distal parts of the bone. Now the bones themselves are tied together with this strong and dense interosseous membrane, which run between the shafts. You can see it running down here, all the way down, similar to what you have between your radius and your ulna. And this provides a lot more support for both of, both of these structures. Now there's just minimal movement of these two bones during walking or running, although the distal joint can often become sprained during a heavy contact sport. So right down here. Next we have the ankle or the talocrural joint. This is a this is a hinge or a ginglemus type joint. Fun fact, I just learned how to pronounce that. Thanks a lot, Cassandra. It's comprised of the talus, the distal tibia, and the distal fibula. And at this joint, we have about 50 degrees of plantar flexion and 15 to 20 degrees of dorsiflexion. Now there is a greater range of motion when the knee is flexed, and that's because of a reduction in gastrocnemius tension. Fun fact, if you want to increase your dorsiflexion range of motion with your knee straight, you could try rolling out your gastrocnemius on a foam roller, uh, or even maybe on a more acute implement like a lacrosse ball or something really mashing in there and allowing that tension to release, doing some stretching as well, and then retest your ankle dorsiflexion and you might increase it. Now as your ankle dorsiflexes, your fibula actually rotates about three to five degrees externally and then three to five degrees internally during plantar flexion. Then that's that little bit of movement that we talked about between the fibula and the tibia. Next we have the subtalar and transverse tarsal joints. So this is where inversion and eversion occurs. And these are classified as gliding joints. The combined, move, the combined movement is 20 to 30 degrees of inversion and five to 15 degrees of eversion. And then at the intertarsal and tarsometatarsal joints, there is minimal movement that happens. And then at the intertarsal and tarsometatarsal joints, there is minimal movement. Now the metatarsophalangeal joints, there is more movement. Obviously, these are similar to our fingers, a little bit less movement though. We do have a difference between the range of motion and our great toe, which has about 45 degrees of flexion and 70 degrees of extension. Whereas the MP joints of our lesser to toes have 40 degrees of flexion and 40 degrees of extension. You can also abduct and adduct your toes minimally, but some people actually cannot perform this movement and that might be due to underuse or the fact that we always shove our feet into shoes for our lives and then we walk around and, and we lose that proprioceptive ability and perhaps shut off our ability to use those intrinsic muscles of the foot. Now, the most common type of injury at the ankle, as I'm sure you can guess, is an ankle sprain. A sprain involves the stretching or tearing of one or more ligaments. Most commonly, this occurs at the ankle due to excessive inversion, which causes damage to the lateral structures. Primarily the talofibular ligament, which is right here, and the calcaneofibular ligament right here. Okay, so these two. Eversion ankle sprains are much less common and part of this is due to the fact that the fibular head down here at the lateral malleolus extends so far distally and this provides a lot more structure to protect against an eversion sprain. Now, what, if it does happen, it's usually the deltoid ligament right here that is injured. You know, parts of these structures coming down, providing that medial support. 
Now we talked a little bit about the arches already and that the foot has three of them. Well, we have two longitudinal arches, the medial and the lateral. Here's the medial and here's the lateral. The medial arch extends from the calcaneus to the talus, navicular, the three cuneiforms, and then the proximal ends of the first three, uh, of the three medial metatarsals. Okay, so it's running kind of this way underneath the foot, and the lateral longitudinal arch extends from the calcaneus to the cuboid, and then the fourth and fifth metatarsals. Now the arches can be classified as high, medium, or low, just depending on the morphology and structure of your foot. And then we have the transverse arch, which extends across the foot from the first to the fifth metatarsals, right here. Or in this picture, it's up here. So remember, the arches are there for shock absorption, but also for the storing of elastic energy, so that as your foot hits the ground, we capture some of that energy and return it into the next step like a spring, so that your muscles are not always having to contract concentrically with every single foot strike, and therefore using up a lot of your energy, your ATP that you, you know, have been replenishing because you've been eating and breathing, etc. but rather to harness the energy that you have thanks to gravity and thanks to the potential energy and to turn it into forward motion. Now your plantar fascia assists with that. It's a broad structure extending from the medial calcaneal tuberosity to the proximal phalanges of the toes. It's essentially like this sheet of fascia underneath your foot that has a sort of dense layering and, it's, and it also is multi-directional. It's kind of like a, almost like a trampoline web sort of thing. And it assists in stabilizing your arches and in propelling your body forward. Now, an unfortunate injury is plantar fasciitis. This is pretty common and it's very painful. And remember that story about my wife breaking her fifth metatarsal? Well, just before that, she had just overcome a year-long bout with plantar fasciitis that had put her out of running for about a year. So she had plantar fasciitis, super painful to run. She had to really limit anything she did, wear special funny looking shoes. And then she got back into running four or five weeks later at my sister's wedding, pop, she broke her fifth metatarsal out for another year. It was a bummer, but now she's back and running faster than ever. So you can, you can heal. But plantar fasciitis comes about because you either ramp up the intensity or the volume of training or exercising too quickly. My wife got it as she was training for a mile road race, which she got second in, it was pretty sweet, uh, before we moved here to San Diego. And I think that we just increased the intensity a little bit too quickly. And then we had to sustain it because the race was coming up and we thought we could manage it, but then it just sort of, the plantar fasciitis kind of got out of control and it took a while to heal. So here are the movements of the ankle. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion is what we primarily think of. Dorsiflexion involves bringing this dorsal surface of the foot towards the tibia, and plantar flexion is like planting your foot and bringing that away. Then we have eversion and inversion. Remember this occurs at the subtalar joint. Eversion is turning the underside of your foot out or laterally away from the midline and inversion is turning the underside of the foot towards the midline and you'll see in this video right here there's a little bit of forefoot abduction and adduction going on accompanied by the eversion and inversion and then we have toe flexion and extension it's really hard to do this with individual toes And finally, pronation and supination. Now these are interesting because pronation and supination are both combinations of three other types of movement. So pronation involves ankle dorsiflexion, subtalar eversion, and forefoot abduction. Okay, all of those together. And you can see it happening. You can see the creases forming here in her ankle as she dorsiflexes. You can see how her toes are sort of wanting to lean this way as 
her as she goes into pronation, into abduction, and you can see her navicula kind of dropping um, as she everts and points to the undersole of her foot laterally. And the opposite for supination. You can see the skin on the front of her ankle sort of stretching out as she slightly plantar flexes. You can see her toes moving this way into adduction, and you can see the undersole of her foot turning towards the midline. So that wraps up the movements for the foot and the ankle joints. To continue learning, head over to this video where we'll talk about the muscles of these joints. If you want to check out any other videos for this course, the Structural Kinesiology playlist is here to my left. I'm Dr. Jacob Gooden. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.